we're here at the Central Park Conservancy uh, with our weekly walk for you. This is part two in our um, obscure statue series. And this is a presentation that Ryan put together, but I will be presenting it. Um, and my name is Carla and I'm a guide with the Central Park Conservancy. And our mission here at the Central Park Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well-being of all. So thank you for uh, joining us for this. And before we get started, just a reminder of the tools you can use with Zoom. Um, <clears throat> as always, you can use the chat feature to say hello. Um, and add comments throughout our presentation today. And a reminder that if you don't want to see the chat previews, you can click the little arrow next to that and uncheck show chat previews if you don't wish to see uh, chat popping up. Um, and then you can use the Q&A feature if you should have any questions. And my colleague Jose on the back end um, will be answering any questions you might have. And you can also, um, you can use the <clears throat> closed captioning feature um, if you'd like. Now, on our walk today, um, we're going to be looking at some obscure statues. And of course, obscure can mean a few couple of things, um, different things based on your perception of that word. But when we say obscure statues, we're referring to statues that are less widely known than some of the park's favorite statues, uh, such as Angel of the Water statue, which so many of us know. And so some of the statues we're going to look at today, you may know very well, um, some of you may not, or perhaps you just haven't seen it in a long time, so it's a little obscure in your memory. But we're going to start here um, at 96th Street. <clears throat> at, and Fifth Avenue. And we are going to end, this is kind of a funny map today, because uh, we're making quite a distance here on our journey today. We're going to end um, at 77th Street and Fifth Avenue. But we'll enter the park here at East 96th Street. And right now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, Carla, why are you taking us down the transverse road? <clears throat> Well, it might not immediately look like it, but this is in fact part of Central Park. However, this is not actually an entrance to the park. Um, this, as this sign lets us know, um, this is not a true entrance, but rather a small triangular section of the park that is blocked off uh, by the transverse road, uh, bordering it on 96 and 97 streets. Um, so we can't enter the park from this section, but we might as well check it out while we're here. And already we see a statue, as well as these nice benches and plantings. And here is our first statue <clears throat> of our walk. And here who we see is Albert Bertel Thorvaldsen, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, um, but he was a Danish sculptor. And Thorvaldsen was born into a working class family. Uh, he worked with his father, who was a woodcarver. And then at age 11, Thorvaldsen was accepted into the Royal Danish Academy of Art, going on to win many medals and honors at the Academy. And he would actually receive a stipend to study and work in Rome, where he made a name for himself. Um, and upon his return to Denmark in 1838, Thorvaldsen was received as a national hero. So Danish Americans who were seeking representation in New York City and in Central Park specifically, donated the statue in 1894, um, which was created from bronze in Copenhagen in 1892. And it mirrors a marble sculpture that exists in Copenhagen um, created by Thorvaldsen himself in 1817. And the statue features a few other details, um, such as a small bronze recreation of Hope by Thorvaldsen, which his statue's depiction leans on. You can sort of see that here. Um, however, some of his most well-known works can be seen recreated in the bronze along the pedestal. There are two best relief style medallions of night and day. So let's take a look at those. Here we have night. And on the other side, we have day. 
Now, this statue, uh, which was originally located near the 59th Street and 6th, near 59th Street between 6th and 7th Avenues, was eventually relocated to 96th Street and 5th Avenue sometime in the 20th century, uh, before it was eventually relocated here. Uh, to this odd triangular subsection of the park in 1940. But no matter where the statue is located, the Conservancy will keep it looking clean. And this statue actually received restoration by the Conservancy uh, in 1996. And as we leave Thor behind, we can walk just south of the 96th Street Transverse and enter CP, Central Park. <laughs> And I don't know if you can see that, but we will watch our eyes, uh, watch out for low flying pigeons who might be entering our field of vision. And let's head to our next obscure statue. So we'll cross the road and take a little walk along the reservoir. And we can take a nice leisurely stroll along the bridle path as we make our way to our next stop. And along the way, we might as well enjoy some of the last of this season's cherry blossoms, which bloomed a little early this year. Uh, than some of the previous years, but luckily they some of them have stuck around for a while so we can still enjoy them. Now several species of cherry blossoms can be found around Central Park on the east side of the reservoir where we currently are, uh, but we primarily see Yoshino cherry um, blossoms on the east side. However, we can also note a few Kwanzans scattered along this side as well, which is what we're viewing right here in front of us. Kwanzaa and cherry blossoms have more petals um, than the Yoshinos. Typically, Yoshinos only average about five petals for flower. Um, and that results in more petals covering the ground. So even when they fall off the flowers and off the trees, we get to enjoy this beautiful pink carpet uh, for spring, which is still quite wonderful to enjoy. And as we walk south along the bridle path, we can also note um, some really beautiful trees coming into, uh, just starting to leaf out for the spring. Like this really magnificent English elm here, which stands at Engineers Gate located at 90th Street and Fifth Avenue. And right here, we can also note a statue located at Engineers Gate, one that may be a bit obscure to some folks. This is a bust dedicated to John Purry Mitchell. Sometimes he is referred to as the boy mayor because when he was elected mayor uh, to New York City at the age of 34 in 1913, he would actually become the youngest mayor in the city's history at that time. Mitchell was a reformer and he was also a politician who fought corruption during his term as mayor of New York City between 1914 and 1917. And after losing the election for a second mayoral term, Mitchell enlisted in the Air Force. While in training, he sadly fell from his plane and died. Uh, so he didn't <clears throat> actually get to see action and sadly died during training. But local newspapers immediately proposed a memorial. The funds were provided by small donations from New Yorkers and the memorial committee hired the prominent architect Thomas Hastings. Now this bust is inset into a stone wall that is flanked by two stone urns on pedestals and the stairs leading up to the reservoir. And the ornamental pillars on either side of the entrance relate to the carvings that frame the portrait bust. Now the reason why Mitchell has a home at Engineers Gate is because one of his accomplishments while on office was to preside over the opening of the first water tunnel in 1917 which also explains why his memorial is appropriately located near the reservoir. But be sure to check out these lesser noticed but very detailed pillars the next time you enter the park. So even if the statue isn't obscure, you may not have noticed all of these wonderful details before. And some really interesting, uh, some of the further details of the urns are these uh, bison or buffalo skulls, which are also included in the um, base of the flagpole that's outside of the New York Public Library, which is also um, memorializing John Pori Mitchell. All right, we'll keep moving on to our next statue now. And we can enjoy, let's make our way down here to our next statue and appreciate some more trees leafing out here.
And we can appreciate that our next statue is on a lawn, so a little softer under our feet. We can enjoy that uh, experience under our feet of having a softer lawn to walk on. And we can also appreciate some other spring blooms other than cherries, as we have a few magnolia flowers still left on this magnolia tree. And we finally made it. Now, some of you may be saying to yourselves, I thought this was supposed to be an obscure statues walk, and this man is certainly not obscure. Uh, many of you may be familiar with exactly who this is, but while this character is uh, much better known than some, actually, he wasn't all, um, all that popular during the time his statue was ac um, actually erected. So here we see, of course, the statue of Alexander Hamilton. And the statue was donated to Central Park in 1880 by one of Hamilton's sons, John C. Hamilton. And he commissioned the German-American artist Carl H. Conrads to create the likeness of his father. And that was based after a 1778 bust of Hamilton uh, by the Italian sculptor Giuseppe Siracci. Now, this figure is made of uh, completely from carved granite. Of course, Alexander Hamilton had many accomplishments. Um, if you're not already familiar with them from the musical Hamilton, we'll just give a brief overview, and I won't wrap it or sing it, I promise. Um, but he was a co-author, of course, of the Federalist Papers. He was the first Secretary of the Treasury for the United States, and he was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. And of course, perhaps most importantly to many of us, he was a notable New Yorker. Having first traveled to the city as an orphan teen in pursuit of an education, Hamilton became a longtime resident of the Manhattan neighborhood now known as Hamilton Heights. And he ultimately built a country estate in Harlem um, <clears throat> called the Grange, which still exists. And you'll find lots of restaurants and bars in that area utilizing that name. The figure of Hamilton here stands with one hand gripping a roll of documents and the other resting in the opening of his vest, while down below what we see here on the pedestal is a cap, a sword, and a sheath, which was representative of a duel that he had with his political rival, Aaron Burr, in 1804, in which Hamilton lost his life, and he was later buried in Lower Manhattan's Trinity Church Cemetery. <clears throat> Now, one of the interesting details here that Ryan noted was one of his favorites are the stars that you see on the sides of the pedestal. So on the north, west, and south sides, um, we see three stars. But then on the east side, <clears throat> we find four stars. And so if you're following along and doing your math, uh, you'll see that those add up to 13 stars which represents the original 13 colonies which existed in the early uh, United States of America, of course. Now, while Hamilton was well known during the 19th century, of course, he was not as widely recognized as he is today. In fact, um, only about 500 people attended the 1880 monument dedication of this statue. In comparison, more than 2,000 attended the 1876 dedication of the monument to uh, American statesman Daniel Webster. Now, Hamilton's recent fame, of course, has uh, some thanks probably to the popularity of Hamilton and American Musical, which debuted in 2015, and has really made this statue and other Hamilton sites around New York destinations for both New Yorkers as well as tourists. And as we leave Hamilton behind, we can take a little stroll behind the Met. Walking around the building back towards Fifth Avenue, and as we come along the exit of the park, we stumble upon a beloved, but perhaps a bit obscure of a statue. This is, of course, the Group of Bears statue. <clears throat> the Group of Bears is a bronze sculpture by American artist Paul Manship, and it marks the entrance to the Ruth and Arthur Smadbeck Heckscher East Playground. Now, those with a keen eye may notice that something on this plaque, it reads original bronze cast in 1932, this bronze cast in 1989, which is an interesting detail. 
Now, Paul Manship, who created this piece, first created the Trio of Bears in 1932 for the Paul J. Rainey Memorial Gateway at the Bronx Zoo. And later, he created a, um, a smaller group for the top of one of the piers at the Osborne Gates at the entrance to Ancient Playground, just six blocks to the north of where we are now. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art also has a version of this work in their collection. Now, the sort of block-like style of this bronze piece um, is really playful and imaginative, and it's an interesting representation of the bears. And the pedestal encourages interaction with the artwork, making it all that much more enjoyable. And of course, this work of art, um, <clears throat> We can see where folks interact with it, especially um, because that is where it's most polished. So clearly this bear gets a nice uh, snout petting uh, very frequently as he's here in the playground. Um, but it's also important to note that this is a memorial. Um, in 1988, Samuel Friedman approached the Central Park Conservancy about do donating a this group of bears uh, to the park as a memorial to his recently deceased wife, Pat Hoffman Friedman, who died in 1988. Um, she was a furniture designer who introduced avant-garde and early 20th century European designs to American households. And this sculpture was dedicated in 1990 at the entrance to a new playground just south of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so you can kind of see the stylization of the bear seems very appropriate in that case. And as we leave the three bears, we'll start to venture to our last destination on our walk today. And for our last stop, we're going to head south and visit the Alice in Wonderland statue. And we'll meander along the east side on this sort of overcast day, passing by Cedar Hill, eventually reaching our final statue today, the Alice in Wonderland statue. And perhaps uh, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, Carla, you're lost. This is not where the Alice in Wonderland statue is at all, um, <clears throat> but it is. Uh, there are actually two Alice in Wonderland statues, of course, in Central Park. While the bronze work that was erected in 1959 might be the most famous, and perhaps that's what you were thinking of, um, there is also a more obscure Alice statue, of course, that we're looking at here, located presently in the James Michael Levin playground. And as we walk around the sculpture, we can note the quotes that are inscribed along it, which are quite interesting. Spare me from judging harshly. May I never fail a friend nor fight a foe, but fairly. In the depths of despair, may I never lose hope. Her greatest wealth was her heart of gold. Now, in 1936, the philanthropist August Heckscher donated the fountain to Central Park as a memorial to the American journalist and social welfare advocate, Sophie Irene Loeb. And Loeb focused her journalistic and social attentions on welfare for widowed mothers. She was elected president of the New York City Welfare Board in 1923, and Loeb helped to found the Child Welfare Committee of America in 1924. She also fought for immigrant use of New York City schools and civic centers, and fought for the cleaning and fireproofing of movie theaters, the installation of public baths, the funding of school lunches, and support for housing reform, quite a bit. Um, Heckscher and Loeb had campaigned together for the addition of children's playgrounds to the park, of course. Now, if the style of this looks a little familiar to you, um, that is likely because the American artist Frederick Roth created the fountain which features 13 characters throughout it. And Frederick Roth is of course, the most well-represented artist in Central Park. Um, among the characters included here, we can see Alice in the center, as well as the Red Queen on the left there. And we also see the Mad Hatter 
And uh, the fellow down here is either Tweedledee or Tweedledum. I don't know how to tell the difference between the two of them, uh, but that's got to be one of them. And of course, an interesting aspect to this fountain's evolution is that it no longer provides drinking water, uh, but rather recreational water to play in and cool off on a hot summer's day. So several of the characters' carvings now help to decoratively spew water out of the statue's base into the surrounding fountain area. And some of the fountain's original drainage systems allow for its upgraded new use as well as additional drains on the floor around the statue, um, help to make sure that water doesn't, there isn't standing water for too long in the area. And while we still work through a few more weeks of chilly weather here in New York City, before we know it, uh, we'll see this fountain being uh, used quite a bit in warmer days here in Central Park as we make our way through spring and approach summer. Now, before we run out of time today, I want to make sure to conduct a little poll with you folks and hear what kinds of statues you enjoy. And so I'm curious if you are someone who, uh, what your favorite kind of statue is in Central Park. Not your favorite statue, but are you someone who loves a good horsey statue, um, like the statue of Jose Marti or General Sherman. Perhaps you most appreciate our one statue that features actual historical women in the park, the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. Or maybe you're more into fanciful, playful statues like either of the Alice in Wonderland statues in the park or the group of bears uh, or even Hans Christian Andersen. Or maybe you are an Olmsted and Vox purist and you prefer that statues not impose themselves onto the beautiful natural landscape. Um, so we'll see uh, what your favorite statue is. And as we end our walk today, <clears throat> We had an opportunity to see just a small handful of some of the park's most obscure statues. Um, in fact, including this other Alice in Wonderland and of course what it looks like in the summer when it is warm and folks can play in that water. Um, and we've made our way to the end of our walk. And of course, with over 140 statues and monuments in the park, there's always something new to see. And we hope today you were able to see a statue that you hadn't seen before. And in terms of statues that you folks love, it looks like uh, the overwhelming winner uh, is fanciful, playful statues, uh, such as Alice in Wonderland and Hans Christian Andersen and the group of bears. Um, and with a close second, uh, we have the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. Um, and I'm, I'm surprised that more people aren't into the horsey statues, but uh, those are some of my favorites, I have to say. Um, but very interesting to see where people lie on their love of statues. And speaking of statues, if you didn't get enough statues on our weekly walk today, um, we have an upcoming tour of our statues and monuments where uh, we look at mostly different statues than we looked at today. And that's coming up on Friday, May 12th at 2 p.m. And then uh, in June on Thursday at 2 p.m., June 1st. Um, and my colleague, Jose, will share the link in the chat uh, if you're interested in signing up for that tour. But I want to thank you again, as always, for joining us for another wonderful weekly walk and sharing your thoughts in the chat. Uh, remember that you can connect with us through social media um, in all different ways. And uh, we thank you again for your continued support of the Central Park Conservancy. And we'll see you again next week. Stay safe and be well. And thank you from everyone here at the Conservancy. Bye, everyone.